So we're going to get into the Word of God. I hope you have a Bible with you. If you don't, we will have the verses up on the screen for you. But if you have a Bible and you want to follow along at home, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 49. We've been in this chapter for a while now. Uh, We're nearing its end, but we're not quite there yet. And we're going to look at just two verses, verses 27 and 28. So if you are willing and able, will you please stand even at home as we honor God at the hearing of his word? Genesis 49, verses 27 and 28 say this. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey, and at evening dividing the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. The word of God, you may be seated. Well, allow me to take this opportunity to remind all of us where we are in the book of Genesis and specifically where we are in chapter 49. We've been in this chapter, like I said, for a while, even dating back prior to Christmas and the Advent season. So we've been in it for a minute, uh, for sure, but what we see in this chapter, and it it has been very interesting to learn about the various uh, sons of Jacob and and the corresponding tribes that come from these children, and uh, what Jacob is doing here is he's he's, he's about to pass. He, He is about to die. Before the end of this chapter, he will have passed on. And the the death and burial of Jacob is what we will look at next weekend if the Lord wills it. But what he has here is he has words for each of his sons as they've all gathered around him during his last, he's maybe hours away from death, perhaps even minutes. And he has words for them. And now we're finishing up with the last son, the youngest one, Benjamin. Now, I don't know about you, uh, when I think about Benjamin, I always think of him as the baby brother. He's like, he's like the one being pampered all the time and protected and cared for. Uh, everybody's always concerned about Benjamin. And, and I think that might be because when Jacob was told the lie about his favorite son, Joseph, that he had died, I think what happened was for Jacob, he funneled all of that affection he had for Joseph and he poured it into his now youngest son, Benjamin. And, you know, he didn't want Benjamin to go to Egypt, if you remember that, you know, kind of protecting him, keeping him safe. And then when Benjamin was in Egypt, everybody's all concerned, you know, how do we get, you know, Benjamin back to dad because he's, he's baby Benjamin, which what makes Jacob say to him here, very interesting. I like what the very popular commentator Matthew Henry has to say about this. He says, It is plain that Jacob spoke by prophecy and not by natural affection. Otherwise, he would have spoken with more tenderness of his beloved Benjamin. So what does he say to Benjamin? He he says something very short. He says, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. And then verse 28 is kind of a summation of what we've looked at thus far in Genesis 49. So we really just have the one verse here dedicated to Benjamin. And I have to confess to you that when I first read verse 27, I didn't know what was going on. I I didn't know what to make of it. Because we know, we've seen so far that, that, that Jacob is often using poetic language. In fact, the whole, uh, the whole point here in, in Genesis 49 so far has all been poetry. And he's talking about various animals and he's kind of using cloaked language a little bit. And I read, okay, Benjamin is a, is a ravenous wolf, devouring the prey in the morning and dividing the spoils in the evening. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is it good to devour the prey? Is he saying something positive about Benjamin or negative? Is this a blessing or a curse? Because as, as we've seen, Jacob has, has a, a mixture of blessings and curses for his kids. 
He doesn't always give them something that's positive and a promise of prosperity in the future. Sometimes he comes with something quite negative, uh, a curse even, uh, something that he's, he's saying that is, is a hard word where he's pointing out to them a character flaw within them. So what is he saying of Benjamin? Is it good to be a wolf? Is it good to devour your prey? I honestly didn't know. So I had to go to the people much smarter than I am. Uh, that's the beauty of the Bible is it's been poured over time and time again for literally centuries upon centuries by very smart people who know a whole lot more than I do. So I looked at what they had to say. And far and away, by, by a long shot, m- most people, the consensus is that what he's saying is a positive thing. There were a few people that saw it as a negative. But I think what's going on here, and I hope to flesh this out here, is that being a wolf is a virtue, not a vice, meaning it's a good thing, not a bad thing. But being a blessing that Jacob is giving here to Benjamin, this blessing comes with a warning, as we will see. So since Jacob's words here are prophecy, he's, he's foretelling in, into the future. What we have to do is we have to look at the descendants of Benjamin, the people that would come from the line of Benjamin known as the Benjamites. And unlike some of the other tribes where there's not really any prominent or notable people, not the case with Benjamin. Some very notable people come from the line of Benjamin. Probably the most notable in the Old Testament would be Israel's first king, King Saul. Remember King Saul? He was a Benjamite. And Saul, as the first king, he brought much to the table. Saul, the Bible tells us, was tall and handsome. But I don't think he was a pretty boy type. Saul liked to throw the fists. He he, he would be ready to square up with any adversary at any time. Saul was likes to fight guy. You know who likes to fight guy is, right? He likes to fight. He was in his glory last night with the UFC fight card sitting in front of his television watching it. Saul's kind of like that guy. And and the other kingdoms around Israel, they all knew it because they had experienced just how formidable Saul was out on the battlefield. A a warrior. He, he He was a man of valor skilled in battle, aggressive in combat. That was Saul. So we're just beginning to see some of Jacob's prophetic words coming true in, in this case, one of the descendants of Benjamin. Let's look at another one. Another one, uh, not as well known, but still kind of prominent. He's one of the judges. I think he was the second judge. Uh, he, he might be memorable simply because of what is recorded in Judges chapter 3. So what is going on at the time? Israel has fallen under the rule of Moab. And, and Moab uh, was led by a, a king who was, who was a wicked king subjecting the Israelites. And his name was King Eglon. So we have Ehud the judge and Eglon. And I, and I kept wanting to say Ehud, and Harry and I were talking about this this morning. I think that's our Americanness coming through. I don't think it's Ehud. I think it's Ehud. So I'm going to try not to stumble. It's Ehud and Eglon. Ehud is the judge, and, and Eglon is the king. And as the ESV puts it, Eglon was a very fat man. Now, I just love the scriptures. No political correctness whatsoever. He's not overweight. He's not heavy set. He's not big boned. He is a very fat man. And so Ehud, he sets up a meeting with this king and he's going to take him out. And we'll see that happen. And one of the, the features or characteristics, I guess, of, of Ehud is that he was left handed. And a lot of the Benjamites were left handed. And, and he was able to, to get through the guards on his way to the king uh, because of being left-handed. He, would, he, he fixed the sword to his right thigh that we'll see in a minute. And so he got into the king with a weapon and he came in undetected. So he rolls up on King Eglon and we pick it up in verse 20. 
And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. That is so gangster. I mean, that is such a mafia line straight out of Goodfellas. He's about to whack him and he says, I have a message from God for you. Straight savage. And he rose from his seat and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt, that's the handle, also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade. For he did not pull the sword out of his belly and the dung came out. Some of the best imagery in all of scripture. The fat closes in over the blade. And so Ehud either can't get the blade out or just leaves it in there. Dung is falling out the backside of this king. And so what happens next? Ehud leaves the chamber, he locks the door, and he bolts. So the king's servants, they come back, and they see that the door is locked. And they, they, they think, well, the king is in there, and he's, quote, relieving himself, which incidentally, he is uh, quite involuntarily, though. So, so they wait outside. So the, the, the servants are waiting outside, and they're waiting, and they're waiting. And after a while, they realize, we better go in and make sure that the king is okay. So they get the key, they open the door, and what do they see? There lies the king with, a bell, with his fat belly and a sword sticking out of it, dead in a pile of his own feces. Who says the Bible is boring? I mean, really? I mean, is this not one of the great accounts in all of Scripture? And so what happened after this? Well, this and the ensuing events caused 80 years of peace in the nation of Israel. So what do we see with both of these men? King Saul and, the, and Ehud the judge. We see boldness. We see bravery. We see zeal. They're warriors, aggressive, fierce. Sort of sounds like a particular animal, a wolf, perhaps. Again, we're beginning to see Jacob, Jacob's words come to fruition. When he said, as his departing words to Benjamin, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. So what are, what are wolves known for? Well, they're known to be ferocious, vicious. They're wild, right? I would say that they're like the alpha dogs. They're, they're the opposite of a poodle. When I was a, a, a little boy, I was a toddler, maybe two or so, uh, my family, we had two poodles. Uh, their names... Uh, I can't believe I'm going to admit this, were Pierre and Suzette. And I'm thinking, what were my parents thinking about? We're Italian, not French. I, I, I got to think some adult beverages might have been involved somehow, some way there. But what's worse yet is the girl, the female, Suzette, when I was two years old, bit me right on my nose. To this day, I'm not a fan of poodles. I, I wouldn't say I'm scared of poodles. I, I think if you say that, you, you instantly forfeit your man card. Just, just give it up, okay? You're done, all right? I'm not afraid of poodles. I just don't like them. But the poodle is like the beta dogs, right? Whereas wolves are the alpha dogs. If I get taken out by a female poodle named Suzette, I'd hate to think what would happen to me if a wolf ever got a hold of me. You don't mess with the wolf. They're, they're hungry. They're, they're these ravenous wolves. That, that's, what, that's what ravenous means, hungry. They have this insatiable appetite. And right about the time where, where I was being bit on the nose by poodles, there was a very popular song out there back in the day by Duran Duran. If you were here, we could do a little interaction and play Name That Tune, see if you know the song I'm referring to, but it is hungry like the wolf. Who knew Duran Duran was so biblical, right? 
But wolves, they're, they're, they're known as surplus killers. I, I, I was unfamiliar with the term until this week. Learned something new. You ever heard the term surplus killer? You know what it means? It means they kill more than they can eat. And I think if they're hungry all the time and they end up killing such that they're full and they got some left over, that says something about their ferocity. So they kill, they eat their fill, and they have food left over to do what? To share with others, to divide up the spoils. Exactly what Jacob says of Benjamin, a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and in the evening dividing the spoils. So this week, it's kind of a slow week at Living Water. Uh, Pastor Mike and I were chatting and we were talking about one of our, our favorite commentaries written by uh, a man named James Boyce. James Boyce was born in Pittsburgh and he pastored out in Philly. So he's a PA guy through and through. He has since gone on to be with the Lord. But prior to his leaving, he left with us just a treasury of biblical insight for us to benefit from. In his commentary on Benjamin, he had a section called The Dark Side of the Force. I love that. Let me quote what he says there. He says, referring to Benjamin as a wolf is a praiseworthy reference to Benjamin's bold ferocity. Yet it is also true that this comparison should be taken as a warning as well. Properly directed, the chief characteristic of this tribe would be a good quality. However, if misdirected, it could become destructive. Boldness would turn to arrogance. Strength would turn to cruelty. Think about it. Passion. It can either be good or bad. It depends upon what you're passionate about, right? Zeal. If you got zeal, uh, we don't know if that's good or bad, right? It's, it depends on what you are zealous for. Similar to, to power. Now, people who, who have good intentions, who, who want to do right, who are godly individuals in this world, if they have power, they can do a whole lot of good. But if you have power and you have nefarious intent, you can cause a whole lot of destruction. Even violence. I would say violence can either be good or bad. Violence isn't always bad. As we saw right here, sometimes godly men and women, they, they get very violent because injustice is taking place Wicked people are in power. It's a fallen world, and they have to be violent to correct that which is wrong, to oppose the forces of evil. And I say men and women. I'm reminded, who, who was it? The woman who, who took the, she, the guy's laying down. This isn't in my notes. I just thought of it. We're just freestyling here. But the, the guy's laying down, the bad guy. Uh, so how's this for biblical exposition? He's laying down. She takes a tent peg, boom, right through the temple into the ground. Instantly kills him. JL, I think was her name. Both men and women get very violent in the scriptures. And we're going to see some more of that. It's not always a bad thing. See, uh, I would even say this, that a man could be extremely violent to you by, by taking a saw to your leg in some sadistic fashion, like some horrific horror movie entitled Saw, which I never saw Saw. I think there's enough horror in the world. I just turn on the news if I want to get hor you know, horrified. Uh, I don't need horror movies. But if somebody was torturing you by cutting off your leg with a saw, that is obviously a wicked act. But that same man could take a saw to your leg, cut it completely off, and it'd be a very good thing. That is, if gangrene is running throughout your entire body, about to kill you, so being a, a ravenous wolf can either be a positive or a pejorative. It depends. So we already saw with Ehud, who was this, he was wolf-like for good. What about the other side of the coin? What about the warning? Or the, as James Boyce puts it, the dark side of the force. Do we have any Benjamites in history that ever act in a similar manner 
but not for a good outcome, but for wickedness and for damage and destruction. We do. And to see it, we'll go back again to one of the most violent, if not the most violent book in all the scriptures, the book of Judges. We go back to Judges where every man did that which is right in his own eyes. There's this this disturbing story. So I I give you a a word of warning. I'm just going to read the scriptures. I will try not to embellish uh, too much, but it is disturbing. And it's, it's covered in the, the book of Judges. covers about four chapters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of set it up for us, and then we're going to look at it. There's this unnamed man. He's from the tribe of Levi. And he's, he's traveling. He's on a journey with his concubine. And he's traveling throughout the region, and he ends up in uh, the uh, territory belonging to Benjamin, Gibeah. To be, example, uh, to be specific there, Gibeah. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. And so he and his concubine end up staying in the home of another Levite who just happened to live in that area, surrounded by Benjamites. Okay, and this man has a daughter. So you got two men and two women together spending the night in, in a Benjamite city, okay? Let's pick it up in verse 22 of Judges chapter 19. And again, I, I give you just a word of warning. This is in the scripture. We, we teach the full counsel of the word of God here at Living Water. I don't know that this has ever been preached before, so it might be new, uh, preached here at Living Water. It might be new to you. <clears throat> Let's look at it. Judges 19, we're going to look at verses 22 through 29. So as they were making uh, their hearts merry, you got the four people hanging out, I don't know, making their hearts merry, maybe having a few pops. Behold, the men of the city, that would be men from the tribe of Benjamin, the text says, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. Very reminiscent of the Sodomite account in Genesis 19. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Violate them. And do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and made her go out to them. He basically shoves the concubine out the door to this mob of evil Benjamites. And they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break... They let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. This is very sad. And her master rose up in the morning, and when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let us be going. But there was no answer. And I think that was because she was dead. A little tidbit here, there's some ambiguity in the Hebrew. We're not sure if she's dead at this point, which makes what's about to happen even that more horrific. Then he put her on the donkey, and the man rose up and went away to his home. And when he entered his house, he took a knife, and taking hold of his concubine, he divided her limb by limb, into 12 pieces, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. Now, I just want to pause here. Just just let that sink in. I'm going to get a drink of water. What is this man doing? What is he doing? He's sending out, he's mailing, sending out body parts 
of his concubine, a woman made in the image of God. He's sending it out to the various tribes around him. What is he trying to do? He's trying to rile them up. He's trying to outrage them so that they would fight against the Benjamites. And that's exactly what he did. You got the other 11 tribes outraged. They say, nothing like this has ever happened in Israel before. They are completely outraged. They, they gather together, the 11 tribes gather 400,000 soldiers to fight against the one tribe of Benjamin. So who's fighting? You got this civil war taking place. It's the 11 tribes with 400,000 men versus one tribe with only 700 men. And you know what happened? The first two days of battle, these 700 men took out 40,000 of the 400,000 soldiers from the other 11 tribes. As we've seen, these Benjamites can fight. But as the, the battle waged on and the war kept going on, they, they, they couldn't sustain that. They were eventually overtaken and they lost the battle. And this already small tribe of Benjamin was brought nearly to extinction. But they did recover. But the wolf got bit. Bit bad. And I'm reminded uh, of Jesus' words to Peter when he sliced off the ear of Malchus. He said, those who draw the sword, they die by the sword. This is the, the double-sided implication of the prophecy. This is the dark side of the tribe of Benjamin. Dark indeed. Let me give you one more example. This is probably the most well-known Benjamite of them all in all of human history. But he doesn't uh, hit the scene really until the New Testament. And I could just tell you who it is, but I thought what we would do is uh, play a little who am I? I'll tell you what the scriptures say about this individual and then you guess who it is. So here we go. Who am I? I'm, of course, from the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was a Pharisee. I was a violent persecutor. I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. I breathed out threats against Christians. I ravaged the church. I bound and dragged off to prison both men and women. I was filled with rage and fury. And I opposed the name of Jesus. Who am I? Of course, Saul. Better known as his Roman name, Paul, better known today as the Apostle Paul. But when Saul was still Saul, he had some passion. He had some zeal, but he was zealous in all the wrong ways. He, he was devoted, no question. He was devoted to putting a stop to this upstart movement they called the way, the beginning of Christianity. He was a violent man. He was aggressive. He was vicious. He had a wolf-like spirit. Why? Because Jacob's words to Benjamin so long ago found root in Saul of Tarsus and they came to fruition and played itself out in this lost, unregenerated man who was making it his life's mission to stop the threat, as he saw it, of Christianity. But that's not where the story ends. Praise God. This sword cuts both ways, pun intended. See, these passionate and aggressive tendencies can be channeled in a way that is productive instead of destructive. Again, this is the double-sided implication of Jacob's prophecy to Benjamin. Again, I want to quote Matthew Henry. He said, uh, he said the apostle Paul from the tribe of Benjamin in the morning devoured the prey as a persecutor, but in the evening he divided the spoil as a preacher. So what happened? What happened to Saul? How does he, how does he go from being this, this passionate persecutor to becoming a passionate preacher? 
What happened? Well, I'll tell you, Jesus happened. The grace of God became manifest in the life of Saul of Tarsus. On the road to Damascus, you know the story. He comes face to face with the one whom he had been persecuting. The Lord Jesus Christ shows up, basically knocks Saul on his can, and by the time he gets up and goes on with life, he's never the same. Why? He met Jesus up close and personal. And guess what? His passion never went away. Not at all. He was now passionate for all the right things now. It was rightly directed passion. His zeal was channeled into a God-honoring direction. And he, he goes on to, instead of stopping churches from doing what they were doing and the gospel going forth, he's now planting churches. And he writes nearly two thirds of the New Testament. He traded his sword for the pen. Instead of shackling Christians when he himself was a slave to sin, he now shackles himself to Jesus, becoming a slave to Christ. Willingly. What other faith system has that? You talk to other people from other different beliefs and religions and faith systems, and you talk to them about the new birth, about being born again, about being regenerated, about being transformed and changed to being a new creation. You talk to them about that and they, they look at you sideways. They, they can't figure it out. They don't have categories for that. But we do. But if you talk to them about this type of transformation, you know what they come back with? They come back with a whole lot of religion. They got rules for you. They got they got. They got doctrine, they got precepts, they'll tell you what you need to do to join their club. But at the end of the day, that's all they got, a club. No better than the Elks Club or the Moose Lodge. My friends, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ that takes dead people and makes them live, takes them from death to life, from darkness to light. We're talking about life transformation. This is no religiosity that we are doing here at this church and churches around the world. God is still changing lives like he did Saul. He's still at it and he's going to continue until Jesus returns. And what is he doing? He's taking ravenous law-breaking people and turning them into ravenous righteous living people. What do you think made Paul say some of the things he said? Have you read Paul in the New Testament when he talks about the Christian life? I mean, it's like straight cutthroat language that he uses. Let me give you a few examples. Romans 6, 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. That's hardcore. Slaves of righteousness? Really, Paul? Romans 8.13 gets even more intense. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, don't miss that, if by the Spirit you put to death, you kill the deeds of the body, you will live. That is violence right there. That's what he's advocating for is violence. Colossians, he says, put to death whatever is earthly within you. First Corinthians, he says, I die every day. So Paul, what are you saying? Are you saying that Christians need to be more violent? Yes, I think that's exactly what he's saying. But hear him clearly though. It's not a violence against anyone else. It's not against other people or people groups. It is a violence against our own selves. We make war against every sinful impulse within us. And we kill it. As John Owen famously said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And so to wrap it up, I want to quote another John a pastor named John Piper. You may have heard of him. He, he said something. It's one of my favorite sections like of any sermon 
uh, I thought, I couldn't come up with a good conclusion. I'm going to let him do the work, and I'm going to quote him because it's that good. Here's what he said on, on, in the context of this warring against sin and putting to death the deeds of the body. John Piper says, I hear so many Christians murmuring about their imperfections and their failures and their addictions and their shortcomings, and I see so little war. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Why am I this way? Make war. If you wonder how to make war, go to the manual. Don't just bellyache about your failures. Make war. There's a mean, violent streak to the true Christian life. Not against anyone, but our own selves. And all that is in us that would make peace with sin and a settling in peacetime mindset. We make war on that. It is a violence against all lust in ourselves, all enslaving desires for food, caffeine, sugar, chocolate, alcohol, pornography, money, the praise of man, approval of others, power, fame. This is our enemy. This is where we make war. It is a violence against all racism in our souls, all sluggish indifference to injustice, a violence against indifference to poverty and indifference to abortion in our souls. Christianity is not a settle in, live at peace with the world the way it is kind of religion like most Christians live their daily lives. Notice he didn't say many Christians, he said most. So he's saying, where is the fight? Where is the fight? I hope you're in the fight. Because when you look at your failures and your addictions and your, your shortcomings, yeah, you can talk about them. You can bellyache about them. You, 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 you can complain about them. But have you learned to make war 24-7 against them? I'm going to leave it right there. I can't come up with a better conclusion than that. Let's pray. Lord, you made us to be passionate. You made us to care. There is something within each and every one of us that gets us excited. I think about later today as many of us will be watching football. And there will be times when we jump out our seat and yell and scream as we fiercely root for the team we want to win. If we get all passionate about something as trivial as a game that is here today and gone tomorrow, will we be as equally passionate for you and your glory? And for some of us, we have pursued things much worse than the glory of our favorite sports team. We have chased after that which is forbidden. I personally have pursued those things which I know you hate. Help me, Lord, to hate them like you do. Because even though I know you and I desire to know you more and obey you more, I have competing desires within me. And all this talk of wolves, I'm reminded of the old saying about two wolves that are fighting within us. Which one will win? It's the one we feed. May we be feeding on you and your word. You've already given us all that we need. We have your powerful spirit within us that teaches us to say no. You've instructed us on cutting off hands and gouging out eyes, not literally, of course, but in a figurative sense. We are to violently do whatever it takes to fight the good fight of faith so that we might live according to your word. We are surrounded by sin at every turn. And so, Lord, my prayer is simple, that we would enlist that we would enter into this flesh versus spirit battle that is the true Christian life. And we would fight, not in our own strength, but as we read earlier, if by the spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. We have our marching orders from you, the captain of our souls. Be glorified in our lives, please. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So as we dismiss, Pastor Paul and I want to share a, a video with you. 
And I think I would be remiss if I, if I didn't acknowledge that there are many out there, I know it, you're in the battle. You're fighting. You're fighting tooth and nail by the Spirit. But as they say, you win some and you lose some. And perhaps right now you're a little beat up. You're wounded. And you don't need to hear a passionate message about making war. You're like, I'm in the war, Mike. I'm already there. But I'm struggling because I know how powerful sin is. And I know just how weak I am. But I want to remind you that you may have lost some battles, but Christ has won the war. You need to hear that today. And so we want to show you this video. Uh, it's ministered to me. I, ho I hope it ministers to you as well. So we hope you have a great week. This is going to conclude our, our service. Uh, stay safe out there. We love you. God bless. For me to smell and taste Or have I dried up all the wells of grace Could your fountain of love be empty Jesus, is there any more of your blood to cleanse me As soon as I thought I got the sin beat I'm knocked from my feet and dropping in deep Cause I played the whore and despised your glory Even though you've only shown kindness towards me I belittled your worth and spurned your Bible Plus I turned aside to worthless idols But in the mountains of your riches There is abundant grace and storehouses of forgiveness So I'm no longer doubting calamity I thank you that I'm not kicked out of your family I'm that snotty nosed kid who trips my knees are cut But you never leave me down, you lift and clean me up So I'm running back to the cross where you suffered wrath for my sin, I can't fathom the cost So when the enemies condemning me, cause I offended thee I remember that my penalty was paid So the judge ain't mad, cause he took out his anger on you Like you were his punching bag That your spirit convicts us To return back to you where you hear us and fix us Your compassion is deep After I weep, you're faithful to put me back on my feet But the song is dedicated To all my fellow brothers and sisters Who are devastated from falling Be thankful Jesus is so gracious He's faithful even when we're faithless We're not saved in accordance to our performance Otherwise no one would have assurance we're saved through faith in Christ's finished work, which is his perfect life and sacrifice to forgive our dirt. So please be relieved. God sees you in Christ with the righteousness that he achieved. So if you fall, repent, he'll re-heal again. Then get back on your feet and keep killing sin. Don't stay down, look to the cross and the gospel. Get up renewed, but be cautious and watchful. And truly die to your pride. Ask the Lord to create a clean heart and new desires inside. And recall how sins deceit us so grievous. No strive and press on to know Jesus. Giving praise to the King who is risen. Singing, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven.